We're all chasing something. It's the pursuit, finding ourselves in travel and satiating our souls with our craft. My craft is photography. I'm searching for the perfect tool for me. My path has shifted from SLRs to rangefinders, Nikon to Leica. And this is me finding Leica. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Mac Shoots Film. Okay, today I'm off the road for a couple weeks, so I felt like this was a great time to jump in and pick back up the Finding Leica series, specifically focusing on the Leica M6. All right, so the Leica M6 obviously is one of the most iconic film cameras, if not cameras, ever made. This is the Leica that locked me into the Leica family, and I just hit my 90th roll on this film body, and I feel like I'm in a good position to speak somewhat intelligently about pros, cons, limitations, and overcoming those limitations. All right, guys, so with that, let's kick off the episode. So while this episode is focused on the M6, the M6 was not my first Leica camera body. It actually was the Leica M4P. So I think it was November of 2018, a friend messaged me, said, hey, would you like to buy a Leica uh, for a tremendous deal? And you know, I had some disposable income, plenty of curiosity, and I was certain that I was gonna shut down this nagging in the back of my brain for a Leica. So I really loved driving the Leica M4P. Of course, there's no meter, so I used the Voigtlander VC2 meter. There's a link to that below. And I was picking this up on portrait shoots over my Nikon F100 and my Nikon FE2. And that's when I started to worry because I was a portrait shooter and I was used to having all of the amenities in the camera, meter in camera, um, being able to look through the lens to focus and a faster shutter speed so I could shoot wide open with a faster film. And for some reason, I just kept grabbing this. The ergonomics just drew me to it. The film advance lever drew me to it and just the weight and balance of it. So then I was like, okay, I, I guess I'm a Nikon, I mean, a, a Leica fanboy. See, Nikon fanboy. I've been a Nikon fanboy for quite some time. This is actually a Nikon Nikkor lens here, five centimeter F2. I've sold this camera, sad day, first like I ever bought, I've sold it. Uh, Michael, it's coming to you soon. So yeah, the Leica M4P was the gateway drug slash Leica into the family. And you know, not having that meter really f forced me to jump. I love saying forced, it was definitely um, all willing for sure. It led me to the M6. And then why the M6? The, all the ergonomics of the M4P, all the frame lines of the M4P, and that in-camera meter with that classic body. So, bought the M6 and immediately bought a bevy of glass. I did not want to give myself any reason for excuses on why the system was underperforming. I didn't like it. I had some cash laying around, burning a hole in my pocket. Thought it'd be a great investment, and I went all in on German glass. You know, the M4P is a Canadian body, so I was like, okay, if I'm going to have a German body, I want all German glass. So I bought the 35 Summicron ASPH, the 50 Summicron, that's a version 5, and this is the 90 Elmerit F2.8. Now, when you buy Leica, you're not buying skill. You're buying a more solid foundation to build skill upon or to rest decades of acquired skills on, right? So a lot of people think just because they shoot Leica, they're gonna take better photos. That's not the case. It's not gonna make you compose better or see light better, but it absolutely will get all the, the science tech stuff out of the way. For example, Leica glass, Chromatic aberration is almost non-existent. I was shooting Nikon for the longest time, 
and even their best G glass at the time. Of course, now it's the S series lenses, but the G really had bad chromatic aberration, specifically the 3514G as well as the 8514G. Beautiful lenses. The creamy bokeh was amazing, but the chromatic aberration was out of control. Leica has really controlled that, as well as curvature, right, on the 35. It's less bulbous, round in the corners. So it just gives you a great uh, starting point for an image, but you're not gonna be a great shooter just because you shoot a Leica and uh, Leica glass. So I'm sorry if that is dispelling any myths that you have invested heavily in, but guys, that's just not the case. So with the Leica M6 purchased, I was off to learning a rangefinder system and I was taking the camera with me literally every, everywhere. I uh, use the peak design strap system so I can quickly and easily remove the strap. And I would wear that thing cross body almost every day. When I was living in Old Town Scottsdale, I would force myself at golden hour to go out every day and snap just a couple photos with the M6 to constantly familiarize myself with it. And I'll be honest, uh, it was a new camera and I was really excited to have it. So I was just shooting it nonstop. You know, in shooting it all the time, I definitely learned my favorite focal length, right? I had these three lenses. When I shot portraits, I was always an 85 guy, so I scooped the 90 millimeter. Obviously, that's not very practical for a lot of situations because it's so zoomed in. The 50 seemed like it was going to be my favorite lens, but I started realizing the general photography that I'm doing now, um, it's just a little too zoomed in for what I want. Even if I want to stitch together three images, it's still too zoomed in. Enter the 35 Summicron ASPH. This lens is the perfect focal length for me. It's an excessively compact lens, which only makes this package more desirable uh, from an everyday carry standpoint. And the quality is just unbelievable in this thing. So with my camera locked in, my favorite focal length established, I was learning how to focus that rangefinder patch, which is very different. Also, which way the knobs turn, you know, all of the fun stuff and loading the film in this guy. Um, loading film in a rangefinder, specifically a Leica M4 and up, is quite a different experience. I mean, first of all, you have to remove a bottom plate, you turn a knob, so it's very tactile and mechanical, but it's excessively fast to load compared to a film SLR where literally you just pop that off and with one hand you can slide your canister in, drag across across the film strip, make sure it goes between these sprockets here. You don't even have to slide it all the way down. These uh, appendages will do that work for you. And then you just rehook it. It slides it down to the proper depth, lock it down, crank off a couple shots, and you're done, right? Super easy system. So let's talk about limitations and I want to be specific when I use the word limitation I'm talking about limitations that I perceive with the system Some people who have only used rangefinder systems won't even recognize that these could be perceived as limitations Coming from digital then autofocus SLR film cameras to manual focus film cameras It seems like limitations to me. Okay with that in place. Let's jump right in the first limitation is you do not look through the lens. So first of all, always look down and check that your lens cap is off because looking through there, you will not see that the lens cap is off. Thankfully on the M6, if you have a lens cap on, your meter is going to start flashing at you, indicating too little light to expose properly. And then you're going to be like, Hey, I'm only at one second shutter speed in F2. Why is it too little light? You'll flip it down. Oh, there is a lens cap. So that's a saver on the M6. The M4P, you can shoot all day with a lens cap on because there's no meter to tell you that. So I would say the first limitation I encountered was you look through a piece, a glass window on the left that's not connected to the lens to compose and focus. That's wild AF, isn't it? But anyway, moving on. Those rangefinder lines, let's talk about that. There are lines always present through the viewfinder. So your field of view will be obstructed by a couple of things potentially. One, the viewfinder lines for sure. And 
how cluttered they are are based upon the lens that you connect to the body, right? And each rangefinder line comes in a pairing of lines. So there'll be two sets of lines. Whenever you connect the lens, it's gonna automatically select the appropriate pairing of lines. Those lines, so if you're shooting a 35, it's not gonna go out all the way to the edges. So you'll be able to have the buffer on the edge that you can see your subject come into the lines, into the box, and then snap it, right? Also, something else that could obstruct your view is the actual lens itself. The longer the lens, the more it's gonna stick out and be prone to be picked up in the bottom corner of your viewfinder. If that's the case, um, it may obstruct your subject as well. So think about that when you're considering a rangefinder system that part of your viewfinder may be obstructed. So lines in the viewfinder, partially obstructed from those lines and your lenses potentially. And let's talk about the next deal, almost deal breaker for me guys, almost deal breaker was when you put a, a zoomed lens onto a rangefinder, you do not receive that zoomed in effect and view, right? Because we're not looking through the lens, we're looking through this just static side piece of glass, right? And the lens is down here. So, what problem does that encounter? Wider lenses, not so much, right? Because those frame lines are way out here, but the only way they can represent the uh, 90 frame lines and how zoomed in a 90 would be without letting you look through a zoomed in 90 lens is having very small frame lines for longer lenses. Now, I have astigmatism and I don't wear my glasses all the time, so things are super blurry and if I have to look at a very small square, it's almost impossible for me to do that. And I was so discouraged anything past 50, I was 50 millimeters, I was having a lot of trouble seeing. But I found this little guy right here. <laughs> it's crazy expensive. I wanna talk real quick. I have a 0.72 magnifier in here. I think it comes in a 0.58, a 0.72 and a 0.85. 0.58 is like what's in the M3. So if you're shooting like a 50 millimeter, uh, that's gonna be a perfect view. 35 millimeter, uh, 0 0.72, 0 0.72 magnification, right? Um, going back to having small frame lines for longer focal lengths, right? That 90 frame line is like a super small fingernail. I bought the 1.4X magnifier. And what you can do with the 1.4X magnifier is, it is a, a loop, a little magnifier that screws right into uh, the viewfinder on the back. One, this is a 1.4 magnification, 1.4 times 0.72, the magnification in the viewfinder. It gives me true one-to-one -one, uh, viewing in my viewfinder, which is really great. Okay, so once you have the magnifier on there, let's put longer glass on there. Take the lens cap off for sure, always. Let's pop off the 35, throw on the 90, and now, yeah. So, with the 1.4 magnifier, that, those frame lines that are a thumbnail fill up pr approximately 60% of the frame at a true one-to-one, -one, and I can easily focus on this now, which is great. So, the 1.4 X magnifier, really saved the, the day for me. And, and to be honest, I love the 1.4X magnifier with the 50. It takes the 50 frame lines all the way to the edge as if I had connected a 28 millimeter lens, which is great. Um, and then the 35 as well. So if I'm shooting a model, I'll shoot the 50 or the 90 and I'll always run the 1.4X magnifier. That way I get more reliable and consistent focus thanks to the magnification and a one-to-one -one viewing. Another limitation, perceived limitation, is one one-thousandth of a second shutter speed. So typically my lenses are faster lenses, one four, one eight, but since moving to the Leica system, my fastest Leica lens is the F2. That can still cause problems in bright light with fast film. So if I'm shooting portrait 400, I'll rate it at 200. And if it's bright outside, I'm still at 200 ISO 
going to need to stop down beyond F2 to enable myself to get proper exposure. So there's a couple things you can do to shoot portraits outdoors or with an abundance of a light and still shoot a shallow aperture. Obviously, you can shoot a slower film, like a Cinestill 50D daylight. And I shot this in the um, Superstition Mountain photographing the Southwest. I was running a Nikon F4 with a 50 millimeter F1.4 lens, shooting portraits outside, absolutely wanted to shoot wide open, shot a, fat, a slower film, 50, rated at 25, and I was even having to use an ND filter. So this, an ND filter for your Leica system is gonna be a lifesaver. Of course, buy the best glass that you can, because think about it. You are buying $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 glass, like a glass, and then you're going to put like a cheap filter in front of it. It's always um, a preca precarious proposition when I do that. Right? I'm like, am I going to ruin this image so I can shoot wide open? If I can't shoot a slow enough film, I really don't have any other options. Uh, I'll have the link for this below. This is a B&W filter. This is a two-stop ND filter. Great thing about Leica glass, most of the lenses have the same filter thread size, and this is a 39 millimeter, and the 50 uses this, as well as the 35. So buy once, cry once, and this is a two stop. You can buy a variable ND filter, but I suggest not doing that for multiple reasons. One, because you're not looking through the lens, so you can't see the effect being added, how dark it is, and if there's any crazy vignetting. Uh, with a circular polarizer, you can't even see what effect you're applying yet again because you're not looking through the lens. So to overcome that thousandth of a second shutter speed, you're gonna need an ND filter and possibly in combination with a slower speed film. But these aren't major problems to overcome. They are fun challenges and I always accept these challenges. I mean, when you think about the Leica M6, all it really is it's the exposure triangle in a camera body. It has ISO, you'll set that and you're done. It has shutter speed, right? Set that, that's variable. And then you have your aperture, aperture's removable. So two of the three components of the exposure triangle are in the Leica M6. And that is, that is really the beauty of this system is that it is so simple. There is no exposure compensation. There is no match stick meter needle to overload you with a ton of information and shutter speeds. It's, it's two arrows. If the right arrow is lit up, you're overexposed. If the left arrow is lit up, you're underexposed. And if they're both lit up pointing at each other, you're ready to go, right? So you can use that to overexpose or underexpose in camera without having to change your ISO settings or shutter speed. I'll, I'll be honest, a lot of the stuff I'm doing now doesn't require shallow depth of field and I will sit at a thousandth of a second on my shutter speed, whatever my ISO is, and I'm riding the aperture ring shooting F5.6 to F8 typically when I'm out shooting you know, new topographic or uh, landscape or street stuff. So the simplicity of the camera with the robustness of the build, the durability, the quality, the foundation for potentially better images. Remember, you're not going to take better images just because you're shooting Leica. It's just going to have a solid foundation to build those images upon. The Leica M6 really has rekindled my love for photography. And sure, it's silly that something physical can have such a large part in your emotion regarding an activity. But that's just the way it is, guys. Embrace that, realize that. You don't need the best camera to take the best photos. You just need the camera <laughs> that feels the best to you, right? Something that fulfills you when you're running it. And I hope you guys find that. All right, that's in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like it, please give me a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more of this content, please be sure to subscribe. Click that little button down below and the bell so you can receive updates. All right, guys, here's the deal. I'm going to shoot my Leica somewhere. All right, see you guys.